Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We are going verse by verse through the Bible, through the Gospel of John. We come today to John chapter 5, verse 43, and that's right where we left off. So get your Bible, open it up to John chapter 5. We'll begin in just a minute after I give you a quick reminder concerning the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. So check it out when you get a chance. If you're hungry for the Word of God, that's a good place to go because you can study the Word of God from Genesis through Revelation, verse by verse, using my audio Bible messages. That is at thebibleversebyverse.com. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, let's begin reading in John five thirty nine. Jesus says, he's talking to the religious rulers, search the scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. He told them to search the scriptures, the religious rulers, which they did. They, they read the word of God. But they read the Word of God with this crazy idea that by reading the Word of God, they were, you know, building a, a stepping stone to heaven, that, that there was eternal life found in just reading the Word of God. But Jesus says, you're reading it for the wrong reason. Read the Word of God, pay attention to what it says, and then look at me and listen to me, and you will see that the Scriptures point to me. If you would understand the Word of God and not just read it to gain points with God or to try to, you would know and you would recognize me that the Word of God speaks of me and predicted me. So that's what they need to do. And then they would receive Christ. And then they would not go to hell. As it is, that's where they're headed. 40. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. Notice, if you don't come to Christ... If you don't repent and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're not going to have life. You're going to have death, eternal death, which is torment forever and ever in the lake of fire. That's your choice. There's no, sec there's no in between. You submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, ask him to be your Lord and Savior, or you die and go to hell. Because there's no other place to get life except through Jesus Christ. And so it says... Verse 42, 41, I receive not honor from men. Stop there. Jesus was not interested in receiving honor from men. He could not care less if people applauded him or jeered him. He was going to do what the Father wanted him to do. He was going to say what the Father wanted him to say, regardless of the response of the people. And that's the way every preacher should be. That's the way every Bible teacher should be. That's the way every pastor should be. And if you're not, you better get out of the pulpit because you are treading on thin ice. You're setting yourself up for an eternal fall, for big trouble. Okay, verse 42. But I know you, that you have not the love of God in you. Jesus knew these people. He knows anybody, everybody, inside and out, like a book. And he knew that they didn't have the love of God in them. And that's because they had carnal minds, fleshly minds. The Bible says that the carnal mind is an enemy of God. The unsaved carnal mind, fleshly mind, which focuses on the things of this world, is an enemy to God. The Bible says that an unsaved person is an enemy in their minds toward God. Men are by nature haters of God. That may shock you, but it's true. If you're talking about the one true God, the only God that there really is, if you haven't repented and received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're already an enemy of God because he commands you to do that. If you're not saved, you're an enemy of God. That's what the Bible teaches. And you stay that way until God's, by God's grace, he changes you from the inside out, when you repent and receive Christ and are regenerated, and you become a new creation inside, then all of a sudden you want to do what is right. Then all of a sudden you want to obey God 
and you're no longer his enemy. But very definitely, the people that Jesus is talking to here, the religious rulers, are still God's God-haters, and they were very religious, but they were God-haters. Verse 43, Jesus says, I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. The Jews rejected the real Messiah. But history shows that they were usually ready to embrace a false one if he would promise them freedom from foreign oppression, foreign rule. And they're going to do that exact same thing again when the Antichrist offers them peace and safety. They, as a people, rejected their Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But when that Antichrist comes along and gives them false promises of peace and safety, they're going to jump all over him and, and, and just be enamored with him and worship him and, or, or at least submit to him. Verse 44. How can ye believe who receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only. The problem with these leaders is that they wanted praise from people more than they wanted praise from God. They wanted to please people so that people would like them more than they wanted to please God. You know what they wanted? They wanted to be big shots, full of pride. They wanted people to look at them and just admire them and think they were really something special. They wanted to be big shots. But you cannot be a big shot and be right with God. That's why they were not right with God. In order to be right with God, you have to humble yourself, repent of your sin, admit that you're nothing, and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and trust Him to save you from hell. That's how you get right with God. And pride people, prideful people like this aren't going to do it. That's why they die and go to hell. I don't care if they're extremely religious like these guys. It doesn't matter. Verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. Moses, your buddy, the one that you say you admire so much more than anybody else, religious leaders, that Moses who you claim to follow, he's the one who's going to condemn you, not me. You know, these religious rulers accused Jesus falsely when he healed that poor fellow on the Sabbath day. They accused him of breaking the law. Oh, and he, and he did. He broke their religious ritual law. He he broke their man-made religious law. He didn't break the law of God. They accused him of breaking the law, and he did. The law of man. The religious laws that they came up with. But he didn't break the law of God. But he could accuse them of breaking the letter and the spirit of God's law. But he says he's not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. You know why? Because he doesn't have to. Because the written word of God that Moses wrote has already condemned them. They refuse to repent. They refuse to repent of their pride and other sins. They refuse to submit to God. They're already condemned according to the word of God. Jesus doesn't have to say anything more. You know, once the word of God says something, that's it. That's the end of the story. There's no, there's no debate. Just leave it be. It is what it is. You either submit to it or you don't. The Word of God is not on trial, my friends. You are. People are on trial. If you accept the Word of God and submit to it, you're you're found not guilty. But if you don't, then you're guilty. The Word of God's not on trial. You are. How are you going to respond to God's Word? That determines whether you're saved or not. 46. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Jesus is all over in the Old Testament. If they had believed the written word of God, the Old Testament that they had, and that they read so much, if they had just, you know, believed it, they would have accepted Jesus. They would have received him because the word of God pointed to him so clearly. They would have recognized, but their hearts were hard. They weren't interested in submitting to God or receiving Christ, the Son of God. They were interested, like I said, in being big shots. And then verse 47. 
But if you believe not his writings, Moses, because he's the one who wrote much of the Old Testament, at least the first five books, if you believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Well, it won't. They won't. It comes down to this. Do you believe what is written in the Holy Bible? Do you believe the sacred scriptures or not? If you believe the pure word of God, you do not need any other testimony. If they had believed the Bible, they would not be looking for verification that Jesus is the Son of God. They would have sought in the Word of God. They would have jumped on the Jesus bandwagon. Let's go into chapter 6. Verse 1, After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. The Sea of Galilee is in northern Israel. Now, in Jesus' time, there were many towns on the shore of this big lake. And a lot of times Jesus used the beach in these areas as his, as his church. He did a lot of teaching on the beaches of the Sea of Galilee. Verse 2, And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on those who were diseased. The people followed him like ducks. I can remember when I grew up near a park. It was in our backyard, actually. We called it Duck Island. It was down by the river. And it was an island. And that's where all the ducks hang out, hung out. I mean, there were hundreds of ducks on that island. And I remember my older sister would take me down to Duck Island every now and then with some old stale bread, and we'd feed the ducks. And you'd go down there, and you'd pull out a piece of bread and you just break off a little piece and throw it down on the ground, and one duck would come and grab it. And you know what? You could walk around that island. You could, you could walk circles around that island for an hour, and you'd have 200 ducks following you because you gave one of them bread, and they're hoping that they'll give you bread too. And people were like needed, like needy ducks following Christ. They followed him because they knew he cared about them, and they followed him because he helped them. Verse 3, And Jesus went up into the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Jesus gets alone with his men, partly for privacy, partly for teaching, partly for rest. He gets away. Verse 4, And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come with him, he saith unto Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? See, that's like, that's like being called on in class to answer a question when you don't know the answer, you haven't studied, you know, you're not even paying attention to what the teacher says, and all of a sudden, out of, out of all the kids in the class, she calls on you. And, and you, you're just clueless. And Jesus said, where are we going to give food for all these, this multitude to eat, Philip? Where, where are we going to get food for all this multitude to eat? And Philip is sitting there dumbfounded. He doesn't have a clue. Oh, what are you asking me for? Probably is his thought. Verse 6. And this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Jesus, like a good teacher, knew the answer to the question. He's just, he's just testing his student to see if he knows. Verse 7, Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. Philip's answer was, at best, I don't know, and at worst, it's hopeless, Jesus. You know, it's, become, it's possible to become so focused on our problem, like Philip was, so focused on the circumstances, that we forget that we have a God who can do anything and will do what needs to be done. Well, and that's where Philip is right now. He's got, his, he's got his mind set on the problem, the challenge that Jesus brought up, rather than the fact that Jesus is God. Verse 8. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, There's a lad here who hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but 
What are they among so many? Andrew says, well, we have five loaves and two fish, but why did I even bring it up? Because that's not going to do us any good with this multitude. And Andrew is right. They don't have what it takes. They don't. God likes us to know that we don't have what it takes. That way we won't trust in ourselves, but instead we will get on our knees, pray to him, and look to him for help. Mm -hmm. That's exactly where God wants us to be. Notice verse 10. And Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, in number about 5,000. A lot of grass would mean probably springtime. Verse 11, and Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were sitting down, and likewise of the fishes, as much as they would, as much as they wanted. You know what? You're looking at about 15,000 hungry people who have just been fed. And not just a little. They weren't rationing. They had as much as they wanted. Lesson. When you run into trouble, meet that trouble with whatever resources you have. Even if it's clear that they're not adequate, do your best. Pray to God. Trust Him to help you. Christ will supply what is lacking. In other words, like, like was the case here, dedicate whatever you have to the service of Christ, even if it's so small that you don't think it's worth mentioning. Use what you have because it's the right thing to do. But trust in Christ, not in those things. Verse 12, when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Material possessions are a gift from God and should not be wasted. No one should say, I don't have to take care of this thing. I don't have to worry about wasting food because I trust God. No, that's not trusting God. You know what that is? That's putting God to the test. That's what that is. That's tempting God. It's being presumptuous. Anytime anyone acts irresponsibly and thinks, well, that's okay. God will see to it that nothing bad happens. That's not living by faith. That is sinful presumption. So they gathered up the leftovers. Because you know what? Having leftovers is part of God's provision for us. Verse 13, therefore they gathered, that, therefore they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above that which they had eaten. A lot of leftovers. And the disciples are the ones who picked them up too. Did you notice that? They served the people the food, and then they went and they picked up the leftovers. They were not only waiters, but they were also busboys. And we see from this, that the apostles, unlike the religious rulers, did not care about being big shots. They were servants of the people. Whatever God has gifted you to do, be content to use that gift as a way to serve others. Not to impress others, but to serve others. That's the thing that pleases Jesus, because even he came not to be served, he said, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 14, then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. The ancient Jews understood the prophet that Moses spoke about to be the Messiah. He was that prophet. And right now, this big crowd believes that Jesus is that prophet. In other words, they think that he is the fulfillment of Moses' prediction that the Messiah would come. They're thinking, he's the one we've been waiting for. And boy, filling their bellies like he did in a miraculous way, 
that made him awful happy. Boy, that's the kind of Savior that we want. 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, they departed again into a mountain himself alone. He departed again into a mountain himself alone. You say, I just don't get that. This was the Lord's big chance. They were going to make him king right then and there. True. But their idea of a king messiah was someone who would meet all their material needs, fill their bellies every day, give them water to drink every day, multiply you know, the water, multiply the bread, multiply the fish, multiply the food, change water into wine while you're at it. Heal them. Raise them from the dead. That, I mean, that, that was their idea of the perfect Messiah. And of course, also free them, free them from the power of Rome that was controlling them. They were not interested in submitting to the lordship of Jesus Christ, not at all. They were not interested in that, the spiritual priority of Christ. Besides, and this, and this is why Jesus didn't want to submit to them and say, oh yeah, okay, I'm your king, come and make me king. He didn't want to do that because he had the wrong idea. Jesus' mission was to die for the sins of the world. And he's not going to let anything distract him from that. Not even being ordained as the king which would have been an easy road for him. But then those same people would have died and gone to hell eventually because he wouldn't go to the cross and pay for their sin. That's why he came, to save souls from hell. Verse 16. And when evening was now come, his disciples went down unto the sea. Jesus sends his men down, down the mountain ahead of him. And let's see what happens. Verse 17. And entered into a boat and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. <laughs> I suppose he wouldn't. They were sent on, they, his disciples were sent away on the Sea of Galilee in a boat. And Jesus stayed behind. I don't know. Evidently, they thought that Jesus would join them. But he still had not come. <coughs> Maybe they thought he would grab another boat and row out there by himself and catch up to them. Well, actually, it was already dark, so they set sail themselves. They didn't wait any longer for Jesus because it was already dark. And 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 look at 17 again. And entered, well, let's read, let's read 16 and 17 together. And when evening was now come, his disciples went down unto the sea and entered into a boat and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark and Jesus was not yet come to them. Where's Jesus? We're sitting around here waiting for him. We, we better just take off ourselves. Okay. Notice verse 18. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. You know, when they first look, when they first left, when they first set sail on that boat, it must have looked safe or they never would have gone out. The sea was nice and calm. Nice and calm. But notice verse 19. So when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near unto the boat, and they were afraid. Well, it was a huge storm. Like I said, when they first set sail, it was probably nice and calm, and they went to went. But they get out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and it's storming. It's pretty rough. And now they look, and here comes Jesus. Here comes somebody walking on the water in the midst of a storm. They know it's not an illusion, because they're all seeing it. You know what they think? They think it's a night spirit, a phantom. Because that's what the common fishermen of that day, who were often superstitious, believed would happen. On a stormy night on the Sea of Galilee, a phantom spirit would come walking on the water and destroy the boat. That's why there were shipwrecks. That's what they figured. 
Well, they see this thing coming. They don't know who it is, but they're convinced. I mean, according to legend, according to superstitions, this is a night spirit. This is a demon in human form coming to get them to destroy their boat and kill them. So let's read 19 and 20 together. So when they had rowed about five and 20 or 30 furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near unto the boat. And they were afraid, but he saith unto them, it is I, be not afraid. Oh, Jesus knew they were afraid. So did you notice what he did? Yeah, he talked to them. He talked to them. God's voice comforts his people when they are afraid. There's nothing like the word of God. Nothing like a word from God to calm you down when you wake up in the middle of the night and you're worried, you're terrified, you're concerned about the future or the present. It's so very important to pray during those times. And if need be, get up and read that Bible. Talk to God. And you know what? He'll calm you down. I, I can't tell you how many times God has calmed me down in the middle of the night. Get up, pray, pray and pray and pray. Read the Word of God. Sometimes two in the morning, I'm, I'm sitting by the table reading the Word of God. And I read it, I read it. And it calms me down. The Word of God calms me down and I pray. And I fall back to sleep. So Jesus knew they were afraid, so he does what works. He talked to them. And again, I say to you, God's voice comforts his people when they are afraid. Thank God for good friends. Absolutely. When times are tough, it's wonderful to have good Christian friends. But the voice of God is what you really need to hear. Prayerfully reading the word of God will help settle you down when you're all stressed out. 21. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they went. Wow, this was a miracle. A couple of miracles. Jesus walking on the water was one miracle. How about, and it wasn't even calm, not that that would matter. But kind of, it makes it even more amazing because can you imagine these waves splashing over the side of the boat? They're so wild in the wind, and you got Jesus walking on these waves? He must have been soaking wet. I don't know how he saw anything, <laughs> but I guess it doesn't matter if you're God. But it's a double miracle. Jesus walking on the water was one. Then the moment that he got into the boat, the moment that they welcomed him into the boat, they received Jesus. They were at the destination. Bang! Just like that. I don't know what happened. It seems as if God just zipped that boat to the shore and all was well. Pretty neat. And it's so much fun to walk with God, isn't it? It's so much fun to live with God. <laughs> Every day is anything can happen day when you walk with God. And it's great to have him by your side. And one way you can enhance that relationship with God through Jesus Christ is to study the word. And I'm inviting you to go to the scripture verse by verse website to study the Bible verse by verse with me. As I mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast, verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation, study the word of God. Get to know the God of the Bible, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Pray to him. Click the book you want to study. Click the chapter. Open your Bible and listen. And let the Word of God feed you. Let God feed you. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. Please remember, this is a faith ministry. It always has been for over 30 years, which means that I'm brought to you by your prayers and financial support. And you can become a part of this ministry, a very large part of this ministry, a very needed part of this ministry with your prayers and financial support. So pray for me, pray for this ministry, and click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give us the Lord may lead. Until next time, so long.